see that. It was weakness. By the way, I'm sure you can tell I've had a lot of coffee in the morning. So, <laughs> public service announcement don't use the black stirrers, they melt in your coffee. And if you look, the basket is full of these curly Q black stirrers where people are like, what is this? So, white stirrers only. Um, or, use the black stirrers and just don't panic when you get a curly. Oh, there he is. Look, quick. Everybody look back. That's Cheech. He's going to pretend not to see. Oh, now he's going to win. Yay, we got Cheech from behind the screen. Cheech is the MVP. So, uh, anyway, so quick, just quick, super quick introduction. My name is Greg Ayers. Uh, contrary to how you've heard my last name pronounced on the internet, um, I'm a voiceover guy. I've been working in the anime industry for eight, this is so creepy to say, 18 years. Now I know what Scott McNeil feels like when he's like, I've been doing this for 25 years. It's a long time to be the voice of a little kid. Uh, but I started in uh, late 1999, early 2000s, and uh, I worked for really some, I, I started working for my favorite anime company, 80 Films, who are no longer around. Uh, any old school fans? Like, I love, I said old school one time, and someone's like, yeah, I love it, and I'm like, oh yeah, it's so old. <laughs> I remember the first one, it was called Rama, but uh, <laughs> there's an old school joke. Uh, but uh, back in the day, you know, old, older anime days, that was, everything was ADV Films. ADV Films and Pioneer, that was the only two companies. So as luck would have it, um, uh, I was working at a law firm at the time, and I think the misnomer is, I think a lot of people think because I'm a fan, because it's real well known that I'm an anime fan, I think a lot of people think I was just such a big fan, they were like, would you like to do this? That's not how it happened at all. Uh, I've been acting since I was a little kid. In fact, I was doing professional theater when I was like seven years old. I did television and film. And when I got to be a teenager, I just wanted to have fun, like ride a skateboard and spray paint on things and just do normal stuff. <laughs> I love that. Spray painting on things is normal stuff. I still do that. I mean, I don't. Sometimes I think I do that. Uh, anyway, so uh, here's my, I was like, don't leave. <laughs> so I just headed Devin for leaving. I was like, wait, don't go. OK. Um, now it's like you're guarding the projector. Uh, so, so I did theater for a long time, but because of that hiatus, because of that time period where I was just like, I just want to be a normal boy or whatever, uh, I had gotten to the point where I just did theater for fun. Like I would only do theater for fun. And there's, how many, do any of you know a theater person? Is, it, is there a theater person in here? Yeah. Yeah. So you know those people that like, it doesn't matter what show it is, they're like, I'm auditioning. Like, you auditioning for Mary Had a Little Lamb? Oh man, I want to play the lamb. Like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> people that like it doesn't matter what show they're just I'm there I'm gonna play that part so I was not that guy I was just the guy that would only audition for like a show that I thought was cool so it was like it was like Jesus Christ Superstar yeah Rent yeah Runaways yeah Annie Get Your Gun not so much <laughs> like Hello Dolly mm, not today not today uh, so like that's kind of where it was I just did theater for fun and I did it because I liked it um, and so my friends, Monica Real and Chris Patton, had been working for ADV Films for years, and my break would come when they were trying to cast a role in a show called Spriggan. And the last villain is like this 10-year-old boy, and he's like this villain. Well, the problem in anime is when you have a child, you generally have two choices. You either hire a woman and get her to do a scratchy boy voice, or you get like some weird dude whose voice never fully changed, <laughs> and, and or you have the option of hiring a child but when you hire a child, you can only work them for three hours at a time, and you can only work them once a week. So at the time, now it's twice a week, but it's still, you have to be able to do like max six hours with someone who might not even have a lot of experience, so there's a like learning curve. So, um, so as luck would have it, Monica would go to Stephen Foster, and she's like, okay, I know y'all are having a problem casting this role in this friggin', and she's like, I have a friend who works for a law firm who's not able to child. She's like, could you just call him and send his voicemail? And they're like, what? And she goes, literally, he's in his 30s, he sounds like he's 12. Just call his voicemail. So like, my first audition in anime was literally my voicemail at work. Hey, this is Greg Harris. You reach the desk at Greg Harris in the office of Vincent Nelkin. Sorry, I can't come to the phone right now, but I'm at a user's you know, desk helping them with a computer problem. Blah, blah, blah. Leave your name and number. So one morning, I got to work, and I was just, getting the usual morning round of abuse from lawyers, like, there's my laptop's broken, there's I need a mouse cable, there's I need network toggle, and like so on and so on. And then I get to this one message, and it goes, beep, 
oh my god, you sound like a little child. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, my name is Stephen Foster, I'm creating a film, and it was this really Nelly voice that would later be my director in things like Sayuki and Ghost Stories and uh, Angel Beats. I love you say Ghost Stories. And ghost stories, ghost stories, ghost stories all uh, but so it was funny, they called me to come in an audition, and it was weird to me because I was an anime fan, so, and funny enough, I didn't watch anything dubbed at the time. So I was that guy. I was going in the sub snob, like, I don't know what I can do, 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 do. Like, that was me. So uh, I went in, and like, uh, the weave in me took over, because like, as I was auditioning, I realized I was, Mitchie, you look like you just came from like, the world's worst hangover. This is DJ Mitchie, he's gonna be playing music for you tonight, tomorrow night with me. And he looks super hungover, that's so funny. He's like, just walking slowly with dark glasses. Um, so, uh, anyway, uh, the, the, like I was saying, uh, while I was auditioning, I realized I was seeing a piece of animation that none of my nerdy friends had seen yet. And like, I was just like, oh my god. Oh my god. So like, the, the nerd in me took over, and then like, I didn't, and so I made it to all the, like there were three rounds of callbacks, Funny enough, it was between me and a 10-year-old boy. <laughs> who I had the nerve to mad dog at the, uh, the last audition. I was like sitting across from him and his mother going. <laughs> like, all right kid, when this is over, I'm gonna kick your ass outside. The funny thing is, that was Kevin Korn, who would later play Miwa opposite my Iwatari and Dean Angel, which is really funny. And that was his first role. So like, it's super cool, and there's a funny story about me threatening to kill him later. It's funny, it really wasn't. When they first started doing Dean Angel, because he beat me out for my first role, I was doing an interview, and he said, is there any role you'd really like to play? And jokingly, I said, yes, I want to play Niwa in Dean Angel. And if Kevin Corn turns out missing, you should probably check small, shallow graves in my backyard. <laughs> I was just kidding, it was just a joke. And the next time I saw Kevin, he was freaked out. He was like, hi, Greg. Like, it's just this real, like, uh. And the funny thing is, uh, he doesn't do, he doesn't do voiceover anymore. He ended up going to college and being like a band guy, and he ended up doing, uh, I think he does some funny stuff now. But uh, it's funny, so yeah, so I scared poor Kevin Corn. But, uh, but I was glad he got the role, because like that was the beginning of his career as a voice actor. And the funny thing is, then I auditioned for over a year and didn't get anything. And they kept telling me the same thing. They're like, oh my god, keep coming back here with the weirdest voice. And I, I was like, thanks? Like, I guess? I don't know how to take that. So but the worst thing is I auditioned for all the shows that I really wanted to be in, like Generator Gall, Basaraki, Sorcerer's Stabber, Orphan. And then my break would come on a very jigglicious show called Steel Angel Perumi. And uh, what they usually do when you get first get started is they give you just some little bitty nothing role. So I was the little kid that cursed. I was the cursy kid. Go figure, the cursy kid. Um, and so I'm the kid that dares Nakahito to go into the basement and finds Kurumi. I know if you describe this plot line, it sounds like I'm talking about Heaven's Lost Property. Young boy finds large-eyed, large-breasted robot angel, turns her on, she becomes his, you know, he's her master. I was like, well, this is like a lot of shows I've been in. But, uh, <laughs> But anyway, the funny thing is, I was just some little brat, and uh, I like I had to go to my boss because it was going to be four hours recording, which is really weird because now I look back on that character, I only have like twelve lines. I'm like, we spent four hours on twelve lines, but I guess because it was my first time ever recording, they gave me a little bit of a break. So I went to my boss and I was like, hey, I've been given a chance to do something really cool, and I love this. I even prefaced it this way. I was like, now you can say no, but I may quit. I love that I didn't give her any choice. Like, you could say I can't, but I'll quit if you say that. And I said, but I really would like a chance to be a part of something I've been into. And then after she asked me a few questions, I forgot that I had all the McFarlane Akira figures in my office. So she was like, like those little dolls in your office? I was like, yeah, just like those little dolls in my office. So like, it was cool. At least I was, a, you know, proud weave back then even. So, um, so I did that, and I, when I was done with that role, I was super excited because I didn't even care if I ever did another role again. I was just like, man, I'm not doing it. I'm doing this thing. And then like a month later, they called me back, and they're like, hey, now we're ready for you to actually come here and record your, your real part. And I was like, I did record my real part. And they're like, no, you're playing the big villain in the end of the show. I was like, what? And they said, yeah, you're sharing this role with Claudia Black. And so I was like, 
really hot Australian lady from Farscape. How does that work? Uh, so in a in a in a twist of fate, my first big role would be a puffy-haired, blonde, yaoi boy. I know, right? Because uh, I've never played that ever again. Uh, I, I jokingly say a theme that followed me my whole career and life. Um, but uh, so I play this little boy who tries to convince Nakahito, and if this is not a spoiler, you've had 18 years to see this show, um, tries to convince him to kill his robot, basically turn her off. And, he, and he's like, but that would kill her. And my, my character's whole thing is like, people die, things expire. He's like, you know, like she's not even real. When he won't kill his robot, my character backs him up and starts kissing him and turns into this giant, big breasted female robot played by Claudia Black. And it's funny, because when I met her, she's so little, and she's like, this. But when you see her in like movies like Pitch Black, she's so muscular and the way she stands, she looks tall and then she's like <laughs> So as a short person, I got very excited. But uh, when I met her, I was like, we don't sound anything like at all. And then when I heard the transformation, I was like, huh, yeah, we do. So uh, I learned probably one of my most important lessons right off the bat is that if you don't hear things the way a director hears it, and sometimes a director will hear more in your voice than you even know to hear. So, uh, cut to, you know, I did that role, and then I thought I was never gonna do anything else again. I was just like, oh, cool, well, that's the one I'm supposed to play. And then they they had me audition for a cloak show, which I, I, a lot of people don't understand what a cloak show is. So, um, a lot of times a company, when they get a show, like a big show, and they don't want the entire world to find out they're working on it, they basically give it a phony name. So I'm gonna put this into an Attack on Titan perspective, even though this is not true, this is just an example. But like, say for instance, uh, when Funimation got Attack on Titan, they wanted to have auditions, but they didn't want the whole world to know they had the rights to the show. They would cloak the show with a different name. So they would say, hey, uh, can we get you to come in and audition for a new project called Walnuts? And you're like, Walnuts? Yeah, see, there's an Attack on Titan joke. Uh, and then you're like, sure, I like working. And when you get there, if you don't know Attack on Titan, it says walnuts on the script. But if you know the show, all of a sudden you're like, wait a second. So they had me come in and audition for something called Paradise Raiders. And I was like, oh, huh, sounds like a cool, fun adventure show. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Um, they had me in mind for a really cool role. Now, mind you, I was already an anime fan and I watched a lot of anime. And when I got in and started looking at the script, the names of the characters were names I knew very well. It was Son of Goku, Cho Hatai, Shai Gojo, and Genjo Sanjo, and I was just like, oh my god, is this Sayuki? And I was just like, oh, yes, it is Sayuki, shut up. So, uh, so they used to call me fanboy back in the day, because I was the only one that, like, I was always like, oh, you know, Kaisuke the Crow's been working on this manga for you, and, like, was that nerdy kid, so. Um, but the coolest thing to me is, as a fan of the show, I knew I was only right for one character, and it was my favorite character in the show. Uh, so, Son Goku would be my big breakout role in anime, and the funny thing is, uh, the way this industry works, you don't ever work on just one show at a time. Now, mind you, remember, I had to have this talk with my boss, because I worked at a law firm, so, like, suit and tie, imagine me looking like a little Republican, like, a little <laughs> short haircut. But she thought I was only working on one show, which was, at the time, I told her Sayuki, uh, because when I first did the project, the stealing to Kurumi, I wasn't gonna say, it's this boob show. So uh, so when I finally, she's like, now what is this thing you're in? I was like, it's called Sayuki. Uh, but you don't just work on one show. So like two weeks into the recording of Sayuki, they had auditions for this other show called Neoranga. And I'm like, well, sure, I wanna be an anime, so I auditioned and got past the suit box of Neoranga. Then they had auditions for a show called Full Metal Panic. And I was like, well, I'm going to be full panic. I really wanted to be the alarm clock, but I got cast as Shinji. There's this alarm clock that says, wake up, stupid. And that's all I wanted to do. But I ended up getting to play Shinji. And before I knew it, I was in like six shows. And I was taking almost five to, five to 10 hours a week recording. Like I was just never at work. And I was having to come in and work at night so that I could do both things. Uh, so I used all my vacation time. Uh, I was out of vacation time, so I was just taking do not pay hours. Still coming and working at night because I had all my programming and back end stuff that I was doing. I was, this is super nerdy. I was working on uh, application development for litigation support software. So like super nerdy court stuff. 
Uh, but because it was it was it was uh, industry driven, I had to get my work done. So I was like working nonstop, and I was at the point where I thought I was going to probably get called into the office and somebody go, "Well, you're going to have to pick between your fun job and your real job." And the joke was on them because I already decided I was going to pick the fun job. <laughs> uh, because no, like the thing is, working for a law firm, unless you're a lawyer, you're still just a whipping boy. So I was just that guy who got yelled at and was screamed at and like. But here I got to fight like 75 foot spiders. So like, of course, I want to do this. But as luck would have it, and as funny as it seems, the law firm I worked for got in a lot of trouble because they were the outside legal representation for a huge oil and gas giant, which I'm probably not allowed to say by law, but it rhymes with Enron. And uh, we all got fired, or we all got laid off. So it was so funny because like, I was ready to quit. And so we get called into this meeting where they're laying all of us off. Now the funny thing, this just so you know how my little squirrel brain works, the night before I was watching Willy Wonka on TV, and I love TV Mike, the little cowboy kid, because he's just obnoxious. He's like, well, give up, you wish you were me, or whatever. And, like, and he has this one line right before he goes into the taco factory, he goes, well, see you on TV. And I just thought it was the funniest, cockiest thing I've ever heard a little kid say. So just keep that back here. So we go into this room and everybody's like, all of my coworkers are like crying and like they had, they were laying us off in the news. So some people were like coming out upset as we were going in. And we were like, oh God, what is this? And it's like, it was horrible. But like the funny thing is, they took us in this room and they're like, hey, we're gonna give you your severance package, which was like five thousand dollars, I think. And then uh, we're gonna pay you for the next two months. You're gonna get two months' salary, so that was like another eight thousand. And then we're gonna pay you for your vacation, which for me, I, I was out of it, so it didn't matter. But then there was this thing that if we signed this paper that said we wouldn't sue them, we'd get like almost another ten thousand dollars. So like, I just went to this room where they told me about all this free money I was about to get. They were like, we're gonna give you some money, and then if you sign this paper, we're gonna give you a bunch more money. And you don't ever have to come back to work, and we'll give you some money. Oh, and then we're also, we were also vested in this 401k program that we never paid into, so like we got all this money later that we're gonna get. And I just kept sitting there like, I don't have to quit my job. I get a ton of money. I get to go make anime for a living now. I was like, yeah. And I just sat there with this grin on my face the whole time. Everybody else was like, what about my health insurance? And I was just like, yeah, and I, my boss thought I was having a nervous breakdown because I was just like, yeah, I'll do this, yeah. And to be a jackass on the way out, guess what I said? The last thing I walked out of the room, everybody was like, well, it's been really nice working here. Well, I hope you think I did a good job. And I, of course, go, well, see you on TV. That was my last thing I said on the way out of my office. So it's funny, I bumped into one of the human resources ladies the other day and she was like, you know, you said we were hearing one TV and your voice was coming out of my television. I was like, Linda, I was just being a jackass. Like, I had no way of knowing that would actually come true. So, uh, from there, that's all I did for a living. I went on to work for ADV Pumps for years and years and years, and I got to do things like Chrono Crusade and uh, Hello Kitty's Animation Theater, uh, Angel Beats, uh, just tons of really fantastic stuff. And then at some point, Monica, uh, I was at a convention with Monica Real, and she she, so at the time, Funimation didn't do any serious anime. They really only did two things, Dragon Ball Z and Yu Yu Hakusho. That was really all they were known for. Uh, but they had started doing, like they had just done Fruits Basket, and they were starting to license like more and more serious shows. And Monica found out they got a show called Kitty Grade, and she really wanted to work on a show called Kitty Grade. And we were at this convention, so we were, I'm gonna go over there and tell them, I'm Monica Real and I wanna work on Kitty Grade. And I just thought it was funny. I'd go, Okay, sweetie, well, you do that. You let me know how that works out for you. And she did. And she, I saw her walk right up to the fantastic. And she came back and she goes, I'm auditioning next week. And I was like, what? So once she got cast in Kitty Grade, there were a group of us from Houston that decided, hey, we could probably go do this in two cities. Hey, it's my friend DJ. Um, we could probably go do this in two cities and make a living doing this. So then, I think Monica was the first, and then Vic did Broly and Dragon Ball Z, and then I think I was next. Monica and I were doing Case Closed and Spiral, and then Chris Pack, then Lucy, and Tiffany. I think we were the original five that went to Dallas. And so then, 
you had actors like at the time, people were like, oh, you're an ADD actor or you're a Funimation actor. Well, then we were just actors. We just worked for everybody. Uh, so, like, uh, for Funimation, I got to do some fantastic stuff in the beginning. Like, it was mine and Monica's first villain role. We played these two creepy kids in Spiral, which is funny. Spiral is this whole show based on this marketing plan of, like, what are the Blade children? And when the show is over, they've never told you. Like, you have no idea who the Blade children are. Uh, and so uh, then I did like Samurai 7 and Negima and Back in Mongolia Chop Squad. And then the weird thing is the company known as ADV folded was during a downturn in the industry where a lot of things were closing. Uh, Pioneer, Pioneer, um, what did they become? Uh, after Pioneer, I'm forgetting. But any, um, the, all like all, oh man, it's like Japanese. I'll think of it in a minute. Jenny, uh, Jenny unfolded. So ADV was part of that casualty. The cool thing is, the company that derived out of ADV's ashes was a company called Sentai Filmworks. And the cool thing about Sentai Filmworks is they didn't aim to be a big anime distributor. They wanted to be what they called a boutique anime distributor, meaning they would focus on certain types of titles. One of them was Yaoi, which is funny, because at the time, we're like, nobody's producing Yaoi stuff. Uh, one of them, uh, and probably the most important relationship, was a relationship with key animation. Those of you that don't know what Key is, if you've ever been watching a show that was adorable and had cute, look, he's already like, oh god, very adorable, lovable characters, and then one of them dies, that's Key. Uh, so my first big Key show would be a show called Clannad, which is like the saddest show in the world. Um, but that that relationship with Key, my phone is so rude. Um, that relationship with Key would let me go on to do stuff like Little Busters, Epitale of Memories, Corporal Connect, and like all these sad shows, Angel Beats is another Key show. Um, and so the funny thing is, so we're working for two companies, now Monica and I are in the big Toonami relaunch with Dead Man Wonderland, and she and I are both like big, big like horror movie and gore fans, and we jokingly said to each other, we're like, man, we'll probably never work on a show this bloody ever again. And Sentai the following summer picked up the rights to a show called Another, which is a bloodbath. So uh, so I continue to work for both companies. Uh, I'm wrapping up. There are people like me and he's still talking. Uh, I continue to work for both companies. Now I also work for uh, a few other video game companies. I do stuff for Okachan and uh, Flick, Flick Nation, I think it's the name. Uh, I just had a big audition that I can't talk about, but it's for a very well known game company, so I'm hoping that will turn into something. Uh, but let me see some of my biggest new projects because I'm sure I've left something out. Notice I didn't say Aura because I know somebody's going to ask about it. Um, uh, but some of my new big projects, uh, I, I'm super excited that I'm in the Sony Pictures release of uh, Starship Troopers Trader of Mars. It's their new Starship Troopers franchise, and I actually live. Nobody ever lives in Starship Troopers. Uh, I've been brought into the Dragon Ball universe for a second time, uh, and I play the little crappier version of my brother. My brother is the voice of Frieza, by the way. Frost. Uh, I play the little meaner version of Frieza called Frost now, so uh, I'm now in the Dragon Ball universe. Uh, keeping with the tradition of uh, young, yaoi-ish looking boys in sports anime like you're dressed as uh, my character in Free. I'm now uh, also in the Haikyuu universe. I play Yuni Shinoya and Haikyuu. I'm super excited about that. Uh, and there's a few more that I don't know if I can talk about. There's one that I'm really excited about that I can't talk about until next week, of course. Uh, but yeah, now this is the easy part. Now y'all can ask me questions about ghost stories or my fat prairie dogs or whatever. And I'll awkwardly look at you and drink my coffee. Yeah, so you've already got a question. Man, I've got to get this coffee quick. What? I have two prairie dogs. Their names are Earl Laverne and Shirley. Uh, they're like a dysfunctional lesbian couple. Uh, they're so adorable. Like, one has to have her belly scratched to go to sleep. So, poor Laverne has to scratch Shirley's belly. And it's so funny because she just, like, gets in the cage and scratches her belly. And once, once Shirley is like, Laverne doesn't know what to do, so she just lays across it. <laughs> so, I have many pictures on my phone. It's just like a, a child, if you want to see my fat prairie dogs. I have a special. Most people have a vault on their phone for naked pictures. I have one for pictures of my doggos. So, um, you want to ask me about my doggo kids, and then we'll show you my fat doggo and my fat prairie dogs. You think I spoil my pets? Hmm. Uh, but yeah, the prairie dogs actually, sadly enough, they're about four, and that's close to their life expectancy. So, like, I know, it's sad. 
the cool thing is, when you get prairie dogs, you know they only live for a certain amount of time, so the goal is to spoil them as fast as you can. Uh, but these, these girls look pretty healthy, so they might make the six year mark, I don't know, they're pretty, they're pretty wild. Now, I just recently uh, moved back with my folks. My, uh, my dad had some health problems, and then my brother did too, so I moved back home to try to help with some of that, and my mother spoils my prairie dogs rotten. They get a slice of, because my dad gets oatmeal and bananas in it, so now every morning they get this care package. My mom, and I don't know how she realized, I guess she realized they love to tear up paper, so she takes a tissue and puts oats and a huge slice of banana, and then just kind of squishes it and puts it in there, and they're like, oh, oh, banana time. So like, my mom is spoiled. My prairie dogs look like little bears now. They're shaped. Like, <laughs> like when they, they go up to the bars, they're very, their arms don't work the way they used to, let's just say that, they're, or their shorter looking arms. But uh, they're really funny. And uh, they, they, I saw, I found, the reason I have the Great Dogs is actually because they were on uh, this TV show. They did a whole section about what great pets Great Dogs made. This has a full nerd 360. The clip that everyone calls a dramatic gopher, that is from that same program. The one where the Great Dog goes, what? That's from that morning Monster Made TV show where they were talking about prairie dogs. So that was the first time I ever saw prairie dogs, and that's, that clip became famous. But um, the, the reason that I thought they were cool, they have them in, a lot of people have them in Tokyo because houses are so small, and they're very clean, and they're very affectionate, and they don't require a lot of space because they're, you know, football shape. So, or, or a little smaller, like, TV football shape. So, uh, so yeah, so that's how I ended up with prairie dogs. But I've had, I've had a bunch of exotic pets. I've had a ferret. Uh, I want a capybara, but I don't have a room for it. It's like a giant rat with duck feet, but, but they're so lovable. Um, I've had a, a hedgehog, um, snakes. I've never had a fruit, a uh, sugar glider. That's all I want. Um, but when I go home next, not next week, but the week after that, my friend works at the aquarium and they're having sloths, and I might get to pet a sloth. Pee on myself if I get to pet a sloth. That's my that's my like dream animal. So, uh, but yeah. So those are my prairie dogs. So who's got another question? It could be about anime. Yes. <laughs> oh my God! You want me to do it? Do you know the way? Uh, I my favorite is Why Are You Running? Because I've seen the film. That, I've seen the film that that line is from. For those of y'all that don't know, all the weird Ugandan knuckles thing actually comes from a filmmaker that makes these ridiculous films for like $200. And they're like full films. You can watch most of them on, on YouTube. But uh, why are you running? Uh,